Um, so yes, hello everyone. Uh, the title of the talk today is over here, Some Controversial Truths, uh, Challenging Some Commonly Held Ideas About Closure, About Software Engineering, and About Startups, and uh, Sharing the One Secret That Will Solve All of Your Problems. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, some of you might not know me. Um, as I mentioned to Bruno, I started using Clojure many, many years ago. This was before Clojure 1.0. Um, I have written a lot of Clojure over the years. I've been lucky enough uh, to more or less work with Clojure full time now for 15 years. Um, I've been working with Clojure open source uh, for about 12 years. And um, I have uh, consulted to companies using Clojure or transitioning to Clojure. Um, I have led a few Clojure teams and um, I had spent a lot of time on my own projects. Uh, in Clojure or built in Clojure, Clojure script. Um, some of these were pretty big, some of them are quite small, uh, all kinds of shapes and sizes over the year. Um, currently, I spend my time mostly between uh, Clojure open source and uh, work on some upcoming projects, um, which are also in Clojure. So lots and lots of Clojure in my, in my years. Um, so let's start here. I want to tell you a little bit about what, uh, what the plan is for today. My objective is to tell you some things that you might not be expecting, right? So Ideally, I would even like to make some assertions that you would maybe disagree with. And my objective is to try and convince you. Um, it is very possible that I'm going to fail in some or all of these cases. And if I do that, my hope is that the exercise anyway might, have help, uh, might help at least to clarify some of your own thinking uh, on the topic. So if I'm wrong, maybe it, talking this through will help you understand uh, why precisely am I long in, wrong in some more detail. Um, the intention isn't exactly to be provocative or controversial for the sake of controversy. Um, I picked a few of these things because I believe that the ideas I'm going to touch on today actually do matter. Uh, these are areas where I believe accurate views actually do make a difference. Uh, so it's worth talking about. Um, I'm going to go pretty fast uh, and I'm casting quite a wide net. So um, breadth rather than depth. Uh, hopefully this is all going to make sense in the end. Uh, there is a unifying point that I do actually want to make at the end. Um, and there will be time for questions uh, after. If there's anything that I touch on while I'm speaking uh, that you'd like me to go into more details uh, on later, we can uh, do that at the end in questions, All right? So to start, uh, the first belief uh, that I'm going to tackle is the belief that uh, closure is a secret weapon, right? So we are going to succeed because we are using closure. Uh, this is a common expression that you'll hear in new companies. Uh, which have uh, chosen to use Clojure and they're excited about it and uh, they are confident that they are going to succeed, their product is going to succeed, their business is going to succeed uh, because they have chosen to use Clojure. Uh, well, we did succeed because we used Clojure. So this is uh, the case of companies which have success of some sort and they attribute that success, uh, success to their use of Clojure. Uh, or our system or product is better than the competitors because of Clojure, right? So these are all, examples of thinking we have closure we're going to succeed as a result of closure and this is a tempting idea right it's a very human thing there are a lot of programming languages to choose from there's always new programming languages to choose from and somehow the people here uh, have chosen closure right we've chosen this particular tool and it is a non-obvious choice right one doesn't accidentally end up with with closure it is a, a niche tool it's a niche, niche language uh, you, normally, there is a deliberate path of some sort that gets you there, uh, which means usually you get there after plenty of research. And when you use this tool, you know, hopefully if you're getting a chance to use Clojure, you use it maybe for many years and you master it over time and it starts to feel in a way like an extension of your thoughts, right? It starts to feel a little bit like you are a Clojure program, right? You integrate with its culture, you integrate with its values um, and with its way of thinking. As I was saying, you know, Rich has designed the language in a particular way with certain kinds of ideas. You start to integrate those ideas, start to become a part of your identity. And eventually we come to the point where we want to believe that this choice to use closure was not only correct, but in some sense inevitable, right? That our choice reflects some sort of objective truth. And as a human thing, excuse me, we eagerly accept evidence of this truth. The reality that I want to put forth is that closure is just a tool. It's a good tool in many cases. It is a great tool in some cases, uh, but ultimately it has strengths and it has non-trivial weaknesses, just like every other tool, right? It can be an asset or it can be a liability. There are, I would assert, reasonable scenarios in which a reasonable person may realistically curse 
choosing closure for a project. And I think that this is important to admit. There are also, I would stress, plenty of cases where the choice of closure doesn't matter much either way, right? The project is not going to succeed because you chose closure and the project is not going to fail because you chose closure. It doesn't matter, right? The success of that project just doesn't bottleneck on the choice. This isn't unique to closure, right? A common belief, Haskell is the secret weapon. A common belief, Rust is a secret weapon. A common belief is Lisp is a secret weapon. And again, as uh, Bruno and I were discussing before, this is actually a common one for people using Clojure because like me, um, a lot of people came to Clojure via Lisp. In particular, Paul Graham um, famously wrote an article that uh, Bruno mentioned earlier called Beating the Averages. And a lot of you have probably seen that. It specifically attributed the success of Paul Graham's company at the time via web largely to their use of Lisp. He basically said, we succeeded because of Lisp. Right, and many closure programmers came to closure by this post. So this is uh, kind of an important one. Another belief: functional programming is a secret weapon. We're going to use that, and we're going to win. We're going to do better. We're going to write better software. Uh, Object-oriented programming is a secret weapon. Right. So I'm betting a few folks uh, here hold the belief that functional programming is a secret weapon. Uh, but this one used to be. Uh, quite widely accepted as well, right? Quite a few people, serious people, used to suggest object-oriented programming was a secret weapon. What's the difference between the functional program and the object-oriented? Um, I think that's interesting to reflect on. Uh, React.js is a secret weapon. Microservices are a secret weapon. Agile is a secret weapon. Framework X is a secret weapon. Pair programming is a secret weapon. It goes on, right? We have an industry which has a tendency to think in terms of secret weapons, right? We think we have made some particular choice about this tool, about this framework, about this uh, methodology, and that is gonna make all the difference. That's gonna make the product succeed, that's gonna make the business succeed. Uh, that is somehow going to, uh, that is going to be the linchpin, right? And the general reality that I wanna put out here is that every tool, every tool, no matter how good, has pros and cons, for a specific purpose and in a specific context. Denying this causes real problems, right? I assert that this is a form of self-deception and it is a problem that is endemic in our industry. We tend to talk almost exclusively about benefits, right? When you're looking at a GitHub page for some library, when you're looking at a Hacker News post for some new language or some new framework or some new methodology that's just been proposed, right? It is talking about benefits. And because we are constantly inundated with this idea of benefits, 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 we tend to get into the, we tend to get to the point where we're actually thinking almost exclusively in terms of benefits. And accepting that deception, I assert, number one, it hinders our learning, right? Because once you've accepted something is true, you start to see only evidence that confirms that belief. And accepting that deception hinders our ability to effectively deal with reality. I assert this is not true. There is no language or tool or framework that is going to solve all your problems and make your business a success. And if you believe that, even to a small degree, I think that that deception is going to prevent you from actually uh, acknowledging reality as it is and making the choices that could have actually made a difference. So actually one of my favorite interview questions when I'm interviewing uh, closure programmers is to ask them, under what circumstances would you not use closure? or what would be the downsides of closure, or whatever it is we're talking about. Let's say we're hiring someone to work on Docker. We're hiring someone to work on Redis. We're hiring someone to work with uh, Node.js, whatever it is. Ask the question, what are the, downsides of this what are the downsides of this particular technology? What are the downsides of this particular framework, this methodology, um, whatever? And something that I find interesting is how remarkable or how remarkably rare it is, let's say, that people will actually have given this question serious thought, right? If I ask people in the audience, what are the benefits of closure? I'm absolutely certain that most people will be able to list at least several things, right? They're gonna reach for immutability, they're going to reach for a bunch of things, and they'll be able to describe them in some depth. But asking the question, what are the downsides, right? Where does closure struggle, maybe? Where do you need to be careful with closure? is actually something that a lot of people have not thought about. Even people who professionally use closure, and I would note even people who advocate for closure. And I think that that's a dangerous position to be in. Um, 
there are many reasons why we tend to think this way. Like I said, it is uh, largely marketing and evangelism, which focuses on benefits. We're always uh, being told this is brilliant for these reasons. You want to use this language or this tool. It's so fast. It's so clean. It can do this kind of concurrency. Those things are incentivized to focus on the positive. And it is generally only through experience that we discover downsides. So there's a cost imbalance, right? It's quick and easy to find out why something's good because everyone's shouting it at you. Um, but to figure out where maybe the pain points are or where the sharp edges are, or where in fact you might not want to use something, that usually comes from experience. And getting that experience is often costly, right? Public post-mortems uh, do exist, but they're rare. And in particular, you don't get very often public post-mortems of companies that have actually died outright, right? The kind of post-mortems you get are often, we tried this thing, it didn't work, we pivoted to something else. Those that die and don't even survive the pivot uh, are rarely uh, motivating people to write posts about them. Um, not to mention that being objective about this is tough, right? We are human. And reflecting on our failures and reflecting on the cause of our failures and doing that honestly can be a very, very difficult thing to do. There is a lot of human psychology at play in this. Um, and it affects what evidence exists in the first place, right? It biases the evidence that is produced in the world. Like I say, there's going to be a ton of marketing and there's going to be very little, uh, uh, very few experiential reports to point out the flaws and difficulties of something. Um, human psychology affects the evidence we see, right? Even if the evidence is out there, if we have convinced ourselves that this tool we're using is correct and good, functional programming is, is the answer, right? we are inclined to tune out evidence that disagrees with that. Um, this is a human thing. And it affects how we weigh evidence, right? Maybe we see a Hacker News post saying, you know, why functional programming is bad. And we'll notice it, we'll note that it exists, but we're inclined not to give it much credence because we figure, well, that must be wrong uh, because my experience and everything I've heard is that functional programming is excellent. Therefore, uh, I'm not really gonna pay much attention to that. This is a human thing. Uh, we discard evidence that disagrees with our own mental model. It's a human thing. So what is my advice? My advice on this, uh, firstly, is to be skeptical of positive signals. Be aware of a tendency for bias, right? Be aware that positive signals are easier to come by and easier to notice than negative signals, especially for something that already agrees with, let's say, the position that you want to hold, right? You want to believe that functional programming is good. You want to believe that closure is your secret weapon because you've already invested so much into it, right? So be aware of this bias. Um, like I said, uh, confirmation bias in human psychology um, and survivorship bias. So this goes to companies which say that they have succeeded because they use closure or because they used uh, functional programming or because they use Kotlin or it doesn't matter what the language is. Companies will regularly congratulate themselves um, with some sort of a post saying effectively, we won because we made this choice. And uh, the truth is that is almost always going to be a biased sample because the other 10, 20, 50, 100 companies that made the same choice and failed are not posting about it. So you're getting data just from the one that succeeded. And it's sometimes a little bit difficult, even for the people in it, to be objective about what was really the cause of their success, right? We, we, I often find this when you're reading biographies about business people, for example, right? They will go into great detail about after the fact saying, well, I made this choice and that was why we succeeded. And then I made that choice and that was an excellent choice because it had these effects. But when you're actually in it at the time, it's sometimes very difficult to predict what choices you make, what effect they're going to have. And after the fact, right, it's very easy to rationalize and say, well, it wasn't luck. It was because I made this very smart decision. That's why it worked in the end. Um, so just be aware of this tendency. There is a lot of luck and there are a lot of other factors involved and people are not very good at, at attributing real cause uh, to their success after the fact. They want to believe that it was within their control. They want to believe that it was because of their smart decisions, even when there was a lot of luck. So be aware of this. Um, know the strengths and weaknesses of your tools. So I assert that knowing these strengths and weaknesses uh, intimately, accurately, and dispassionately, without emotion, right, without associating your identity enables you to make better choices. It enables you to mitigate downsides. It enables you to anticipate problems and it enables you to maximize strengths. So this isn't just a defensive thing about, well, functional programming has these problems and uh, I need to protect myself against the problems. It's about having a realistic view of the situation. If you properly understand the strengths and the weaknesses, you can 
position yourself to benefit from those strengths despite those weaknesses. And that is an important thing when so many products, so many projects, so many companies succeed or fail on kind of a knife's edge, right? This stuff matters. Um, an important point that I want to make is that if you believe that there are no downsides to something, it is a good bet that you just do not have accurate information. This is something that happens all of the time. There is some new technology, it ends up on Hacker News, people are talking about it, every uh, user report that you get is positive, it's effusive, it's wonderful, using Docker is the best thing, microservices saved my life. You may get the impression that there are no downsides because no one is talking about the downsides, again, because of various incentives, because of the various costs of producing negative evidence, and you may come to the conclusion, consciously or unconsciously, I haven't heard anything bad about it, therefore, there is nothing bad about it. And I want to make the point, and I'm going to make this repeatedly in the talk today, just because you're not aware of the downsides doesn't mean that they don't exist. Unknown downsides does not equal no downsides, and that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, belief number two, managers are mostly useless. So this will manifest, this idea, this belief will sometimes manifest in the following kinds of expressions. So engineers do the work, managers take the credit. Management is just overhead, right? We'd be better off without managers. Uh, the managers are clearly overpaid. What do, they do, what do they even do all day, right? So these are sentiments I've heard before uh, from serious professionals in serious businesses. These are not unusual comments. Uh, there are variations, which I'd like to include. Uh, business folks are idiots, right? They're suits and they're there mostly because of nepotism or luck or scheming. Uh, marketing and sales are easy if the software is good. Engineering is much harder than some other task X, right? And the person or people doing task X are idiots because their choices are clearly dumb, right? We can see the choices they've made. And as engineers, we evaluate those choices and we say, wow, that's ridiculous. Why would that business person have made that decision? Why would that sales person have made that decision? It's clearly wrong. Right? It's clearly the wrong decision. So I want to challenge this thinking a little bit. And I want to suggest that in reality, managers can be key value drivers. There are bad managers and there are good managers, just like there are bad programmers and there are good programmers. Right? Most people, by definition, are average at what they do. Right? They're neither brilliant nor terrible. They get the job done. This is true for managers, it's true for programmers, and it's true, true for all other professions as far as I know, right? Truly brilliant and truly uh, uh, terrible do exist, but it's rare. Um, trying to understand what I have here. Yes, okay, so uh, why does it look like uh, terrible managers are so common? Uh, because this is certainly a perception, like it does look like a lot of managers are terrible. And um, I want to explain a few reasons why I think this, this perception is, is common. So it can be difficult to judge. Let's get this set up. All right, so it can be difficult to judge, especially it is difficult to judge the value of someone in a different area of expertise, right? Because there is another human bias at play over here. We often don't realize what we don't know, right? So some of you might be familiar with the blub paradox. I think this is also Paul Graham expression, which is um, used uh, sort of also in uh, in defense of the idea of Lisp being a superior language, and the blood paradox was effectively when you have uh, a language that doesn't have a certain kind of feature or a certain kind of capa uh, capability, let's say macros, right? You're using PHP, you've never had a need for macros, you don't know what macros are, your language doesn't have macros, you don't even have the ability at that point to really understand what the value of macros are. And when some Lisp person comes along and tells you, well, macros are cool, you're inclined to dismiss it, because having never used macros, ever having never had access to macros, uh, you don't even understand why one would want macros, right? So in a sense, you have to have a certain amount of information about something to even understand the value of it. And I would like to make the assertion that the same kind of thing happens uh, with people, right? It can be difficult to judge the value of someone in a role that you don't understand. And often the way that we try to judge whether someone is competent or not, is solely by low resolution outcomes, right? So we see the work that they've done or we see the results of the work that they've done, but we often lack important information, things like context, constraints, priorities, trade-offs. We don't understand what went into making that decision. And 
It is often the case that bad looking decisions are often not as bad as they look. Once you have all of that context and you understand the things that are being juggled, right? Um, so judging competence based solely on res low resolution outcomes is difficult. Another reason that it's difficult to judge is that value is often nonlinear. So one critical choice, uh, for example, a directional choice can often make the difference between a huge success and an utter failure, right? And relatedly, uh, value is often only weakly correlated to time or sweat. So there's, um, there's a common kind of anecdote. I think there was one with Richard Feynman during, uh, during the Manhattan Project. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of variations on this, which is a bunch of people are working on some problem. They're struggling with it. Uh, they consult with an expert. The expert walks into the room, immediately solves the problem with you know, one, one stroke of the pen, leaves the room, and everyone's aghast that they, you know, they found the solution. And then the question is, uh, you know, did they work to do the solution? Was that, uh, you know, how should we feel about this, basically? Um, and the point that I want to make over here is that uh, it is often the case that the value that we produce is not directly correlated to the actual sweat that goes into it. Sometimes experience over many years or insights that you've developed allow you to answer some kind of a situation, again, especially directional style things, in a way that appears easy on the surface and yet is still valuable. And this is often the case, like I say, with directional things. Um, I want to note that this is one of the reasons that management and business and, in fact, engineering sometimes can be undervalued. Because we look at the engineer, we say, oh, well, they just solved that in five minutes. It can't be that they're working very hard. Uh, why should we pay them? But actually, they were able to solve that problem in five minutes because they've dealt with a thousand problems like this before. And that's come from 20 years of hard work, right? This is something that exists in engineering, and it's something that exists in other fields. It's sometimes difficult for us to understand uh, where is that experience being baked in and, uh, uh, and maybe obscured. Um, another reason uh, is that uh, management value or business value, other kinds of value are often hidden, right? For example, uh, many managers produce value by helping to avoid costly problems, right? So the evidence that you would have that they've done a successful job is that nothing happened. There was no fire. There was no uh, massive event. Right? Silence is the result of successfully doing that job in some circumstances, which is ironically actually one common source of bad management because it can be difficult even for companies to properly evaluate managers, right? Companies want to know that their managers are doing well. How do they evaluate managers? Well, they often have the same problems evaluating managers that we do, that engineers do. And one of the ways that they might evaluate managers is which manager seems to be working the hardest, right? Which one's sweating the most? Which one's staying up until 9 p.m.? And what you'll often find is that the managers uh, visibly putting out fires, right, get the most exposure, right? They, they are most obviously, uh, they're the ones that are most obviously putting in the work and therefore uh, maybe most subject to positive perception. But that will be true even if it is their bad planning or their bad management that has caused the fires in the first place. Right? So it can happen that actually, uh, as I would put it, uh, a common source of bad management is, is also this effect. Uh, finally, I would note managers often act as value multipliers. So for good and bad, um, the value of a team is usually combinatorial. Right? Um, so Businesses don't hire people out of charity. In general, a business is going to pay you X because they believe that you can produce more than X in value. And one perspective on that, in a way, means that everyone is always underpaid, right? Because the, the business is paying you X, you're producing more than X, therefore you're worth more than X, therefore, in a sense, maybe you're being underpaid. Um, but this is often wrong thinking because the value that an engineer can produce isn't just a function of their code, but it is a function of cooperating resources, right? So we're talking here about sales relationships, supplier networks, sales and marketing, capital and assets, uh, and especially business direction, right? If you have a crack engineering team and they are consistently building terrific software that is doing the wrong thing brilliantly, that is no good, right? They need the right direction in order to produce value. If you are directing brilliant programmers to produce the wrong thing, they are not going to be able to produce value. So it's kind of a multiplicative function. Um, and managers often have that effect. Business people often have that effect. Um, 
which is also why, by the way, bad managers can always be uh, can often be so destructive, right? Again, if they're making bad decisions or if the business people are making bad directional calls, doesn't matter how good your engineering is, doesn't matter how good your tooling is, uh, that stuff's not going to matter if it's a product that no one wants. Um, so a bad manager can realistically hobble a whole team, even a whole organization. And the fact that that is possible um, is actually, I would say, proof is one indication that the role is multiplicative, right? The fact that they work in this way to multiply their effect across the, the, the team. This is one indication that that's the case. It's like, um, uh, it's like a factor for the cooperative productivity of others. Um, so if it's a good factor, if it's greater than, greater than one, then they're having a positive effect on the team. If it's lower than one, then they're shrinking the product productivity of the team, something like that. Um, and I just want to end with this thought that the inability to evaluate skills outside of our own domain is a common problem, right? Like I said, businesses struggle to evaluate engineers. We know this. We know that businesses struggle to evaluate engineers. Businesses struggle to evaluate managers. Engineers struggle to evaluate business. If you would ask the managers um, to evaluate the engineers, they would struggle. This is a bi-directional, unidirectional, uh, bi-directional, unidirectional. Anyway, it, it's true in all directions is what I'm trying to say. Um, when you're not familiar with the particular role, uh, you're not going to be in a good position to um, to judge someone's value in that role. Uh, good. So advice. Um, firstly, be aware, like I said, that judging the value of other people can be tougher than it looks. And especially the tougher than it looks, I want to stress, because a lot of these things, again, play on human psychology. You may think it's easy, and therefore it may be tempting to jump to a conclusion. Um, in particular, a, a trick which I would propose is always be in the habit of asking yourself, what would make a good manager, CEO, salesperson, right? Think about that. Think about that really. What would, it, what would a good business person actually look like? What would a good manager actually look like? And what would be the hard parts of their job? What do you imagine the hardest thing that they're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis is? And I would propose that if you cannot enumerate some non-trivial challenges for that role, then you probably lack the information necessary um, to actually evaluate someone in that role. This goes back to the same thing that I was talking about earlier, where you don't know the costs of functional programming, or you don't know the cost of microservices, therefore coming to the assumption that there are no costs. Uh, it's a similar kind of thing here. You might not be aware of what the challenges are in being a manager, or what the challenges are in being a business person, and therefore conclude that there are no challenges. And that's often wrong. There are challenges, uh, you're just not aware of them. And if you're not aware of them, you probably shouldn't be judging someone in that position. Um, next up. Uh, remember that an apparent dumb decision has at least two explanations. So a dumb decision may be a dumb decision. Uh, it often is. I'm not denying that. But when it is made in a domain that is outside of your area of expertise, and notably when it is made with unknown context, right? You don't know the context, you don't know the constraints, you don't know the priorities, just be cautious. My advice is just be cautious about applying a... Uh, let's say, realistic confidence estimate. It looks awfully dumb. It smells awfully dumb. By all means, it may be dumb. But just apply some level of imprecision to your confidence estimate because you don't know the confidence and it might not be in an area of your expertise. So you have to accept that there is a possibility that there is something you don't know that informed that decision in a way that you would have maybe made the same decision with the same information, with the same priority, with the same context. Um, and in these cases where you see something that looks dumb, my advice is to interrogate rather than disagree. In other words, instead of saying, that's a stupid decision, ask the question, why did you make that decision? Because even if the conclusion is that it was indeed a dumb decision, I believe that by asking in, in sort of an interrogative style, in other words, you're asking, why did you come, to, come up with that decision? You are going to have more information, more context, and ultimately more confidence. Even if you ultimately come to the conclusion, yes, it was dumb, now you will actually have justified confidence in coming to that conclusion. If the person can't give you a good reason, for example, that's a good sign that it's a dumb decision. Well, uh, I don't know, it seemed like the right thing to do. That's probably a dumb decision. But if they can rattle off, long arguments about the various trade-offs they've made to arrive at that decision. That might be something that you should uh, take a look at. Um, and I would note that you will generally uh, be better positioned to advocate for some sort of a change when you approach things in this way, right? Instead of calling out, well, that's stupid. I see this happen in open source a lot, right? 
um, people will see some sort of a design decision that was made in uh, some code that they're not familiar with, and they will conclude, well, it should be this way, or it should be that way. And it, it might be. But even if you're right, even if it should be that way, even if there is some strictly better way of doing something, I think that you are more likely to win allies, and I think that you are more likely to get an honest conversation going if you ask in the form of a question. Have you considered this? Did you consider this particular trade-off? Why is that? That seems like a non-obvious choice that you made there. Why did you do that? Am I missing something, right? Even if it turns out that there's no real foundation there underpinning that decision by uh, approaching it from a place of inquisition, inquisition, uh, inquisitiveness, not inquisition, um, approaching it from a, from a position of inquisitiveness, I think you're much more likely to get a friendly uh, response. You know, shouting stupid decision rarely attracts allies or serious consideration by stakeholders, I would say. So belief number three, 10x engineers are a myth. So this uh, manifests in some of these ways. So this idea, 10x engineers, it's, uh, it's BS. It's just an excuse for arrogance or ego, or it is just an excuse to justify nepotism or favoritism, or it is just an excuse to underpay or to overwork us, right? Uh, the company wants everyone to perform, 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 and that's not reasonable. That's not, uh, that's not how it should be. So. I want to make the case that uh, 10x engineers do actually exist and more that there's literally no upper bound to this amount, right? 10x, 20x in principle can be anything. And this goes back to the point that I was making earlier on uh, about value that managers uh, bring, which is that certain kinds of value are non-linear in practice, right? It is unlikely that someone in your company is going to be writing 20 times more code than someone else, or code that has quality maybe that's 20 times better than somebody else. It's unlikely. But beyond a trivial point, I assert, the value of a good engineer, the value that a good engineer produces, right, is not a function of the amount of code that they write and is not even a function of the quality of the code that they write, but it is a function of the value of their ideas, their experience, their perspective, their insights, right? and the impact of those insights, because the impact of an insight, I argue, can be unbounded, right? So this is a function of both the engineer and the context in which they find themselves. In a healthy organization, if a good engineer is asked to do something that doesn't make sense, they push back on that idea, right? So they influence direction. You ask the engineer to build a certain kind of system that maybe would have taken two years to build, and and in a healthy organization, that engineer, because of their experience, because of their insight, will maybe be in a position to say, that doesn't make sense. And let me explain why. And let me convince you not to go down that road. And now you have potentially saved the organization an unbounded amount of money because you have prevented that organization from undertaking a doomed project, right? The value of direction is, again, unbounded. The right understanding, insight, and argument could prevent a doomed project from ever starting. And this actually happened. So there's a, there's a really good talk by Ed Catmull, who was one of the founders of Pixar. And um, he had uh, an anecdote, which I like, which I think is relevant here. He said that if you give a great film project idea to a, to a bad team, to a shitty team, they screw it up, right? You're not going to get a good film out of that. But if you give a bad film idea to a really great team, they will throw out the bad idea and they will make something great. And there is an idea inherent in that that I think is part of the way that this 10x engineering thing exists. Engineers are often in a position of high leverage. They're often in a position to produce big impact and are often in a position to deploy insight and experience that they've generated over years or decades of work. And that kind of insight placed at the right point can have huge impact. And that's where I would assert uh, 10x engineering can definitely come, come from. Um, so one of the points here is that one of the key ways, let's say, uh, in becoming a 10x in whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's engineering or elsewhere, is looking for opportunities with nonlinear impact, right? And usually, but not always, usually that happens in directional things. In other words, let's do this, let's not do that. Because again, these kinds of choices can make a big difference. You can build a brilliant product, but if no one wants it, it's wasted effort, right? Or you can design a super sophisticated system, but if you could have instead avoided the system altogether with some kind of other approach, which would have just avoided it altogether, that would have saved a ton of time. Maybe it would have allowed you to redirect resources elsewhere. These things, these things matter. 
I want to note, ironically, the regular presence of high nonlinear impact opportunities in an organization can actually be a sign of an, an unhealthy organization. In other words, if people are regularly producing 10x impact, that can itself actually be a form of dysfunction because ideally it should not be possible or at least not be consistently possible for one bad decision to burn $3 million or some bad project direction to only manifest as a failure after three years of development, right? Ideally, there should be steps for cost-effective verification of ideas. Ideally, there should be some mechanism or mechanisms for identifying outsized opportunities or risks, right? In other words, it is generally not great for organizations to rely too much on individuals. And if you have an individual or individuals which are regularly doing this kind of 10x impact, that might be something that you want to take a look at because in general, ideally, you want to be able to distribute that kind of decision making, that kind of impact across more developers, uh, across more decision makers in general, if possible. Um, you want collaborative mechanisms to produce the same kind of results, ideally. Um, I will note that sometimes this 10x thing happens out of necessity, right? Key decisions are tough. Sometimes not a lot of people are going to have the experience, uh, the insight to be able to do them. But like I say, ideally, you want to you, you want to manage this. You don't want this to get out of hand. Um, so advice. Firstly, look for areas with nonlinear impact. The nonlinearity is kind of the key way that you get to uh, these, these big multiples. And not all contexts offer nonlinear impact opportunities. There's a lot of work where you put in any program or any engineer, any person in that place, they're never going to produce 10x anything because it's just not it's not possible in that context. And like I said, that might not be a problem. That might be good. That might be a sign of, of health in the organization. Um, these things are often directional. Uh, let's do this, not that. Um, therefore, be aware of directional processes. So this is kind of a advice also for organizations. Be aware, be cognizant of how your directions are chosen. Is it one person, right? Is there your smart guy or your smart girl in the other room who's you know, constantly getting the insights about what we should be pursuing? Is it uh, collaborative somehow? Think about that. Think about the forces that act on direction, the people, the resources, the processes. Um, ideally, you want more than one person involved in that. Um, and ideally, you have mechanisms for estimating the impact of decisions um, so that it is less likely that any particular choice will end in huge success or huge failure, that you have ways of making your decisions smaller so that the risks um, and indeed opportunities are a little bit smaller, right? You can measure them along the way. Belief number four is an interesting one. Um, we should do the best that we can, right? So this is, uh, we should write the best code that we can or the best system that we can. Uh, we should make it faster, or if we can make it faster, we should make it faster. We can make it more maintainable, so we should do that. We can test it more, so we should do that. The reality I want to propose is that quality doesn't always matter. Engineering is a scarce resource that has alternative uses. I want to say this again because this is actually a really, really, really important thing. Engineering is a scarce resource. You don't have an infinite amount of it. And it has alternative uses. You can use your engineering for different things. You can engineer this, you can engineer that, but you can't engineer it all. You divide it across some set of things you want to do. And I want to note that this is um, taken basically from the definition of economics, right? The definition of economics is effectively the allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. That's the definition of economics. You have a limited resource. How do you allocate it? You can use it for many different things, but not everything. How do you do that allocation? And the same thing is, I argue, always, always, always going to be true in engineering. Because in our universe, engineering is a limited resource. Maybe one day that's not the case. Maybe with AI, that goes away. Um, but at the moment, it's a very scarce resource. And it's an expensive resource. So the way that you use your engineering matters a lot. Not everything can be a priority. If everything's a priority, right? I, we've all seen JIRA boards like this in companies where literally everything is, you know, got five out of five priority. At that point, you have no priority, right? It's the same as not having priority. You, not everything can be. Um, and I will note that if your goal is quality, right, even defining that can be tough, right? Firstly, we have partial information. Things are changing constantly. A lot of us are working with Agile these days. Even when we're not working with Agile, we're dealing with 
uh, changing customer requirements, the market conditions are changing, technologies are changing. So much of our understanding of the world, so much of our understanding of what we're building is probabilistic and uh, subject to change. And uh, my assertion is that it is silly to try and micro-optimize transitory low-impact things. I'll say that again. It's silly to try and optimize or micro-optimize transitory low-impact things. So mindlessly doing the best we can on every little thing, I argue, is a deeply flawed way of thinking. And I want to give an anecdote. I hope I remember this correctly, but um, I think it was Jonathan Blow who said that when he was a younger programmer, he was looking at some code that John Carmack wrote in the context of Doom. So John Carmack obviously wrote Doom and, and uh, uh, Wolfenstein and Quake and so on. Anyway, uh, John, uh, John, Jonathan Blow was looking at code that Carmack had written and it was something to do with the loading of resources as Doom started up. And uh, Blow noted that at some point, there was something in the loading sequence which effectively wanted to pull out like different resources. And uh, conceptually, it was something like a hash map lookup, right? I want resource X, okay, go get resource X. Now I want resource Y, go get resource Y. And Blow noted that in the code, the way it was written is there was basically a repeated array sequence, right? So it would like look through the array for the particular entry, then use the thing, then look through the array, and use that thing. And at the time when he was young, Blow remarked that this was like really inefficient. Why don't you write this as a hash map? It should be it should be something like a hash lookup rather than a repeated array sequence. I, I may be misremembering some of the details, but something approximately like this. And Blow reflected on um, the fact that as he got older, he looked back and realized that was wrong thinking. The way that Carmack had written this was perfect. It was ideal. Not because the array was the mo most efficient way of doing it, but because it didn't matter. Right? Doom is a very big project. It's got a lot of code, and a lot of the code matters. But this particular code runs maybe for a few microseconds once as the game is loading up. It is the correct decision to do the simplest, most easy thing that works and gets the job done. Move on to something else. You have other priorities that are more important. It is the correct decision in this case to do something simple and stupid. Right? And I assert that it is a key part of any healthy organization, whether it's a business or engineering department, to distinguish between things that matter and things that don't. And I want to share an uncomfortable, uncomfortable truth. And that uncomfortable truth, that's not it, uh, is that most things don't actually matter. That's the uncomfortable truth. The difficult thing is that it is difficult to tell which things matter and which things don't, right? Doing this array style lookup when loading Doom and it only took a few microseconds, that didn't matter. Some other things, when you're talking about building a web application and it takes 300 milliseconds to log in, or even a second to log in, does that matter? There's a lot of areas where it starts becoming a little bit more difficult to say. Um, and I want to extend this a little bit to uh, general organizational properties, right? So something that I observe quite often is that Someone will be, uh, there'll be an engineer in an organization and the engineer will look around them and see all kinds of dysfunction in the organization. And they'll say, hey, you know, we have this thing that doesn't seem to work well and we have that thing that doesn't seem to work well and everything around me just seems disorganized and chaotic and nonsense. And there's a, a point I wanna make here as well, sort of generalize this idea, which is that it is sometimes difficult to know what around us in an organization actually matters, right? Is this company going to succeed or fail based on X? Knowing what the company's success or failure or the product's success or failure is going to be based on is actually uh, difficult and it's often unintuitive. I want to give another analogy, um, which I find interesting, which is I think this was during the war, World War II or something, and some statistician, uh, again, I'm probably misremembering this thing, I have bad memory, but the, the, the directional qualities should be all right. So there's the statistician. And he's called in uh, to examine planes that have come back from the war, right? So they went out to battle and they did some dog fighting or whatever, and they've come back and they've landed. And the statistician is being asked to examine these planes and to make a decision about where we should install more armor, uh, additional armor on the planes. And he looks at the planes and he notes the areas that have uh, a lot of you know, damage and areas that have uh, little damage. And the statistician reaches an unintuitive conclusion which is that you should probably install more armor in the places that have fewer bullet holes. 
And that doesn't make immediate sense because you would think, well, the planes that are getting shot in those places, the, 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 pla the places that these planes are getting frequently shot, right? That's probably where you want to put your armor. That's where a lot of people's intuition would go. But the point that the statistician uh, uh, realized was that there is a bias in the sample, right? These are the planes that made it back successfully, right? These are the planes that landed successfully, which means being shot in these particular locations didn't matter so much, which means you probably want to put armor in the other places, the places without bullet holes, because it's those places that probably are being shot and causing the plane to not return home. And the analogy I want to make here is that this is often the case in businesses, right? You look at a business and again, you have a certain context, you have a certain expertise, you look at the engineering and you say, well, the engineering is, is nonsense. This, is, this company is doomed. But actually it's not the engineering that makes the company successful. They have a crack sales team or they have a brilliant network or they have some other kind of asset that they're making wonderful use of. And at the end of the day, the engineering needs to just not be terrible. And that's good enough because it's not the engineering that's the bottleneck in that particular business or that particular project. Um, and I just wanna make the point that this is one of the manifestations of quality doesn't always matter. You need to have some sort of a sense that not all aspect of a project or code base uh, or a system or indeed a company matter the same amount. Um, engineering often doesn't determine the success or failure of a company or product. And uh, the bottleneck is often something else. And again, like I said, it's often product market fit, it's relationships, it's luck. Luck is a big one, right? No one wants to admit that, but often it's luck. So my advice, there is a paradox here. And I think it's an interesting one. Good engineers want to do good work, right? We care about what we do. We care about good code. We care about good systems. Messy stuff drives us nuts. You see a complicated system and you realize it can be simpler and you just, you can't wait to get in there and make it, make it better, refactor it, document it, put some unit tests, right? It's something, it becomes visceral. You really want to do that because you care about your job, right? You're an engineer because you have an aesthetic for engineering. Good engineers want to do good work. They want to produce quality. Um, they want to do everything well, really. And so internalizing the advice that I'm trying to give you, which is to do the opposite, can be tough, right? There will be internal resistance uh, to putting out something messy. If you ask an engineer, just write it in a messy way, get it done quickly. They're, then you ask them that too many times, they're going to start getting angry with you. Um, but I want to assert that getting past this way of thinking is actually important. And I um, want to reach another anecdote from general engineering, which is about bridge building. So there is an expression in engineering, which is that um, it's not super difficult to build a bridge that stands up, right? Successful bridge. But it takes an engineer to build a bridge that barely stands up. And there is actually a really important uh, truth in that, which is that one of the things that makes engineering difficult, and I mean engineering with a capital E, is not just getting stuff to work or doing stuff in the best possible way where best means highest quality, right? I believe that one of the most interesting problems of engineering is this question of economic trade-offs, right? Going back to the notion of engineering is a scarce resource with alternative uses. And I believe that this bridge anecdote and the insight behind it actually um, provides the answer to this paradox. And I, I find it a satisfying one. Um, and I'm gonna explain what I have in mind. Reconsider what best means. Best doesn't necessarily mean the best code, right? Your objective as an engineer maybe shouldn't be to write the best code, but instead to have the best long-term economic trade-off, right? In other words, the best allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. If that's what you see engineering, right? It's not the nuts and bolts. It's not the writing nice code, making things modular, documentation. That is all a part of it. Those are the tools that you use to get the job done. But ultimately, you're building a bridge. Ultimately, you're building a system to solve some purpose, to, to achieve some result. And uh, my assertion over here is that actually uh, focusing on that higher level perspective is a way of resolving this apparent conflict, right? If you see it as your task is to make the best possible allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. Um, so I'm gonna explain this in terms of a, a quality competence pyramid. Um, so I'm making an analogy here as well to the, the conscious competence thing that probably some of you have heard of. So it's like, first, 
uh, you're incompetent in something and you're not aware. So it's unconscious incompetence. And then you become conscious of your incompetence. So then you have conscious incompetence. And then eventually, you know, you move up the, 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 the ladder, but basically first you become aware of something, then you become capable of doing something. And I want to kind of apply this a little bit to engineering and I want to make an assertion that the, um, the highest form of this is unintuitive. Uh, so what I've got over here is this table. It's uh, imagine that it's a, it's a pyramid. So at the base of the pyramid, we don't have a sense of quality, right? Maybe we're a brand new engineer. We don't know what's good. We don't know what's bad. We don't have any sense of code smell or system smell. Um, are we going to be able to produce quality? Well, no, because we don't even know what good quality looks like. One step up from that, so bottom, uh, you know, number two on the on the, the table over here is we do we start to develop a sense of quality. We know what looks good. We know what doesn't look good. Uh, but maybe we can't do it ourselves. So Ira Glass uh, famously spoke about this level a little bit in the context of art. He said, like, you know, when a musician or a writer or something is starting out, you eventually reach that point where you have a, 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 an established sense of taste. You know, you know what's good. You just can't do it yourself. You know, you 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 can you can look at writing and say that's good writing, that's bad writing, uh, but you can't quite produce it yourself, and that's a frustrating place to be in a, for for a creative. Uh, but anyway, that's this kind of level we're talking about. So we're not producing quality because we don't know how, uh, but we do know what, what quality looks like. The level above this um, is where a lot of people think the end goal is, um, which is you have a sense of quality, you are capable of producing quality. And therefore, you consistently produce quality. Everything you do is magic. Everything you touch is great. Everything is maintained uh, and maintainable and clean and beautifully architected. Um, I'm going to make the assertion that actually this isn't uh, the peak that you're aiming for, that the peak is above this. The peak is you have a sense of quality. You have the ability to deploy that sense of quality. You can produce quality on command, um, but you choose to do it strategically. Right? You reserve the temptation you 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 fight the temptation to make everything as good as it can be right um quality can and often does become uh, uh, a constraint i'm going to suggest so i want to put a long-term view on this um i think i'm going pretty slowly i hope everyone's okay with time um bruno said beforehand that i can run a little late so i'm, I'm going to keep going at this pace i hope that's all right i probably will run late uh so a long-term view on quality first i'm going to start with the weak statement this is the one i just made which is that uh, quality doesn't always matter Right, I made the case for that. You might agree with my case or not, but that's the case I made. I want to make now an even stronger case. That long-term quality often depends on short-term scrappiness. So the difference here is it's not just scrappiness is okay or mess is okay, but I want to make the stronger assertion that not only is it okay, it is necessary to actually achieve long-term uh, quality. And um, I will explain this by moving on to my next point, which is uh, technical debt is bad. This is a belief. It's a common one. I see this all the time. We do not allow to do in our code. That is a code smell. We never commit anything to production that isn't perfect. Every commit gets peer reviewed, no exceptions. We're very strict about this. And if the code doesn't scale, we don't merge it, right? It's gotta be fast from day one. And I wanna make the assertion that this is wrong thinking, that technical debt is like other forms of debt, right? And that is, too much debt can be a problem, obviously. And that taking on debt for frivolous, uh, for uh, stupid reasons, frivolous reasons, is uh, is a bad idea. But by analogy, uh, by analogy to government uh, debt, let's say, if the government is taking on debt for some sort of silly temporary benefit, maybe that's something to be angry about. But if they are taking on debt to build power plants and roads and train infrastructure and power lines and dams, that maybe is good debt, right? Why? What's the difference, right? And the difference is, is your debt an investment, right? Debt means you're going to be paying something. You're going to be paying something today. You're going to be paying something in future. And you need to ask yourself, what are you getting for the debt? Because the answer is certain things are worth short-term costs, right? Too much of the debt, uh, too much debt can be a problem, um, but you need to ask, is your debt an investment, right? Be clear what it is that you're buying with it. For example, the common examples of what debt can be useful for in software engineering projects uh, is time to market, right? Uh, sometimes getting, getting to market faster is really valuable. It's really important. And getting to market faster with an inferior product or with a product that's a little bit buggy, with a product that's a little bit slow is actually the right decision. 
because, well, for several reasons I'll get into, but sometimes time to market is going to be one of your priorities and it can make sense if you're making that decision with eyes open and we say, look, initial version is going to be a little bit buggy. It's going to have a little bit mess. It's not going to be very maintainable, uh, but we want to get to market quickly. That's, that's an objective. Um, or relatedly and very important, faster learning. And this one really is going to have an impact. Getting to market quicker, getting the product out the door faster often means that you end up learning faster. You end up learning faster about what people are actually using the thing for, how are they using it, how is it operating in practice. Uh, and I want to make the assertion that the ideal amount of debt is almost always greater than zero. If you are not taking on technical debt consciously, you're probably making a mistake. You are probably losing important leverage. Because when used intelligently, technical debt can contribute to higher quality. And I want to explain how, right? It's leverage. In the real world, we don't usually know exactly what we're building when we start, right? We figure it out as we go along. This is like a key idea in Agile, um, but it's, it's present in all methodologies, right? We figure it out as we go along. And uh, famously, you know, I think, I think it was Eric Ries or, or Steve Blank or someone who was probably the first to mention this, this idea of like the lean startup is basically predicated on this idea. Don't spend three years building a product and then you release the product and you realize no one actually wants the product. Maybe you spend three years really building the best product ever, the best thing X, and no one wants to say you release it and all of that effort, all of that scaling, all of that documentation, all of that maintainability has gone to waste. That is not the kind of engineering I'm talking about. That is wasteful. That is not the best use of scarce resources that have alternative uses, right? If we are obsessed, with optimizing every little thing that we do as we do it, firstly, the company might die. This is realistic, especially when we're talking about startups. If you're trying to optimize every little thing, your cadence, your release, uh, your, your speed of releases, your ability to put things out, to come to market grinds to a halt and the company might die. And I make the, uh, uh, the point that if the company dies, that's not great for long-term quality. Right? Especially if you're doing something that you actually care about. If you think you've got a cool product, you've got a cool idea, uh, it can actually make a difference in the world. If you let it die, it's not going to make that difference. It's not going to improve people's lives. You need to survive, firstly. And secondly, even if you don't die, but if you obsess about every little thing as you go along, it's easy to get stuck at a local minimum, right? You found some optimal way of doing the thing, but it's a local minimum because you've been slow, so slow to adopt, so slow, uh, uh, so slow to adapt, so slow to learn that you have, you have not realized that the world has moved you by, all right? So this is, I guess, something equivalent. I haven't thought of an example here, but uh, you're building a really good BlackBerry and you're polishing at the desk and the iPhones come behind you and uh, completely obliterated your market because now people want smartphones. They don't want your little keypad phone anymore. The same kind of thing happens all the time in software, right? While we're obsessing about some detail that doesn't really matter that much, something big changes behind us and it invalidates all of the work that we're doing. And all of that work just gets thrown away because the company dies or because we realize the users don't actually care about that feature. And that's painful, right? That's a heartbreaking thing when it happens, especially when you put so much work into it and you've, you've, you know, your whole team has built this beautiful thing that is transitory, right? Tears and rain, it, it goes away uh, because it didn't, didn't work in the end, right? Um, so I wanna make the point that this is more than academic, right? This happens often. I have seen this happen often. I've seen this happen even in organizations that were confident that they weren't doing this. Um, yes. So uh, if we hyper-optimize every piece of our product or code or system, uh, making it beautiful, fast, maintainable, uh, it may take us longer to realize, for example, that users are only using 10% of the features. And this is where that uh, strong version of um, my assertion comes in about long-term quality. If users are only using 10% of your features and you realize it and you realize it early, you can apply your engineering to make the best version of that 10% early. Firstly, you can get it out quicker, right? Which is a kind of quality in a way. And you can build it much better because all of your resources can go to that 10%, that key 10% that really, really matters. And you can do that better if you figured out which 10% matters faster. If it takes you two years to figure out which 10% matters, now maybe the business has run out of funds or you've got other things to do and you don't really have the opportunity to really polish that 10% anymore. So you end up with a worse result than if you had done something messy, learned, and with that in informed position, optimize the things that actually matter. So this is a form of premature optimization. Think of it that way, right? Quality can have premature optimization. 
don't do premature quality. Same principle applies. Um, yes. So moving along, um, advice. I suggest taking a long-term holistic view. Short-term quality can be tempting. And short-term mess can be really stressful. I can say, especially for people that care about quality, which is most engineers, especially closure engineers, right? Again, you don't end up in closure by accident. The people who are doing uh, closure engineering for, you know, for a passion, for a day job, they care about engineering, right? They're with closure because they care about good engineering, right? They have that aesthetic. Um, but we live in our universe, unfortunately, which has unlimited res which has limited resources. And um, I would suggest, like I said, there is a kind of peace uh, to be had from focusing on the big picture, long-term process, right? So it's not, don't adopt the mind frame, well, you know, just do whatever crap, uh, and that's the solution. No, just step it up a level and say, my objective as an engineer is to find the best trade-off, right? The best allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. Think about it that way and you'll find your satisfaction, uh, but I would argue it's gonna be more sustainable and you're gonna have a bigger impact in the world. Um, so for this purpose, um, I would suggest by default, right? Try default to reasonable quality. Get the job done as the default. Strategically apply quality once you're sure that it's gonna matter, but just default to not terrible, good enough. But do it quickly and iterate. Try to learn, try to emphasize this idea that you are doing this, right? You're taking on this debt in order to learn so that you can use those learnings, funnel them back into the quality that you care about, that your users are actually going to care about, that it can make, that's going to make a difference, all right? Um, of course, this requires discipline. And um, in the interest of time, I don't want to go into this too much, but of course, one of the reasons I know that companies uh, or engineering departments sometimes don't want to commit to do to production or don't want to take on any kind of technical debt is they worry that if they put something in that's imperfect, business is never going to let them go and fix it up, and therefore, you know, they're going to have sleepless nights because they worry that now we're going to be stuck with this terrible thing forever. And that's an interesting conversation. Um, feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, but I would say uh, fix that problem if that's your problem, right? Business needs to trust engineering and engineering needs to trust business. And I would argue that one of the ways you fix that is by having agreement that not everything is worth doing and acknowledging that sometimes engineering just wants to fix things for the satisfaction of fixing them and having that clean. Like, let's be honest about that. Again, we're engineers, we care. Even if this particular thing doesn't really impact the business, every now and then an engineer's just gotta be allowed to engineer because it's freaking us out that this system is so ugly and so messy. Just let us fix it from time to time. So you, you can negotiate with business to find some way of uh, finding a middle ground. Um, I wanna note an interesting thing here, which is the relationship between this topic, um, the technical debt, and choice of language. Uh, in particular, uh, I mentioned in the context of closure, like closure has pros and cons. Um, I want to note when a business chooses to use closure, they are uh, knowingly or unknowingly, hopefully knowingly, but often unknowingly, incurring non trivial costs, right? So there are downsides to using closure. They are accepting those downsides when they start using closure. Um, and part of the point that I wanted to make earlier on was knowing your tools, knowing its limitations, knowing its strengths. Um, I think the closure is often well-suited, particularly well-suited to iterative quality, right? So um, at the beginning, uh, Bruno asked me, you know, why do I use closure and, you know, what would I miss in another language? And uh, anyway, one of the points that I want to make here, since it's, it is maybe a point that not a lot of people make, is that I think the closure is particularly well-suited to this kind of iterative development, right? because it has a lot of tools for building in sort of a bit of a messy way, sketchy way, scrappy way, let's put it that way. I don't want it to have a negative implication. So kind of a scrappy way. And over time, as you need to, you can make certain parts faster, you can make certain parts cleaner, you can make certain parts uh, uh, more heavily tested. It's well suited to that kind of work. And that's something that I enjoy having a lot of in my projects. Um, I'm gonna try to speed up because I realized Sorry, it's been going on for a while. I'm going to try to go quick. Um, some lightning beliefs. I'm going to fly through these. If anything are interesting, if any of these are interesting, feel free to ask during the questions. Uh, belief X. Uh, uh, belief X is faster than Y. Um, so the hack and use post shows that software X is faster or slower than Y. So let's make a change, right? Or uh, don't use Rails. Rails is slow. Or we should use Nginx because Nginx is fast. Um, I want to suggest that the reality here is that most online benchmarks are useless, if not outright misleading. 
any blanket, context-free statements about performance are almost always a bad idea. Good benching is, is tough, right? And uh, it is easy to get the config wrong, and it is easy, again, human factors, right? Bias motivations. Who is writing these benchmarks? Well, the person who wrote the software or the company that wrote the software. Why are they publishing these benchmarks? Well, they're publishing the benchmarks because they want you to use their software. They want you to buy their product. The incentives are aligned so that they are going to try and show you something in a positive light. And you get some of the same kind of uh, failure cases here that you do in academics, right? Like p-hacking, if anyone's familiar with that. You keep trying different parameters until you find the one where your database looks faster than that database. And you don't know, they may have spent a thousand hours trying every variation of the config of the operating system of the CPU core, the core count of the whatever, until they eventually found some particular combination uh, that puts their product in the best possible light. Just be skeptical of uh, uh, online benchmarks. Um, belief, innovation is the way to succeed. No. Uh, reality is that innovation is neither necessary, uh, neither necessary nor sufficient for success. Uh, belief, always try to hire the most skilled or talented people possible. Uh, we hire superstars, right? You hear that all the time. We have rock stars, we have superstars. Uh, the reality is that it is important to try and hire the right people for the job. And this means matching the needs of the job, the desires of the people, and the various real world constraints that you're gonna be dealing with. Right? Rock stars are often a poor choice in many cases, right? where maybe the work wouldn't benefit from them. Maybe they're going to be bored. Then you have all kinds of problems. Right? Lots of companies get this wrong. And getting it wrong uh, you know, it can lead to overpromising. Right? You get this often in job ads where they're, oh, it's going to be so fun. You're going to have so many exciting things. And then it turns out the work is actually quite boring. It's you're building a crud app, but you're trying to attract the best programmers in the world. Unrealistic expectations like that. Uh, are not going to end well for anyone. You're going you're to have wasted budgets. You're going to have poor work quality. You're going to have poor morale. Uh, you're going to have poor retention. My advice is to hire the right people for the job. And you need to understand what that means in your context. The right people for your job is not the right people for some other job. So um, as with quality, right, this rarely means maxing every attribute, right? Do they need to be the best programmer and the best communicator and the best programmer in closure and the best programmer in Haskell? And they, blah, 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 blah. Probably not. Um, Consider supplementing with training, right? Maybe you want to train someone who's not great in these particular areas. Uh, maybe that's someone who's going to, uh, you're going to be able to retain better. You're, you're going to be able to offer a more competitive salary. Um, there's a litany of things to consider. But anyway, just be aware of this. It's a very common mistake that companies make. They just want to hire the best people that they can. And that's often wrong thinking. Uh, meetings are a waste of time. It's a common one. You hear this all the time on Hacker News. This is wrong. Bad meetings are a waste of time. Good meetings can be an excellent use of time. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the cost of a meeting, in the worst case, is usually about oh, n of the number of people, right? So it's the order of the number of people. It's, it's linear with people. Whereas the value of a meeting is unbounded. If you make a key decision in a meeting because you have the right people there and it was an effective use of time, value is unbounded. Uh, meetings are not a waste of time. Bad meetings are a waste of time. And there are a lot of bad meetings, but that doesn't mean the whole concept is a bad one. Uh, belief, we should aim for best practices whenever possible. No, oh, you hear this a lot, right? This is how Stripe does something. We should do it that way. This is how Google does something. I don't know if anyone still says that, but people used to say, this is how Google does something. We should do it that way. Uh, the reality is that best practices are often just fashion. And in fact, go further and say that they are often an excuse to avoid tough thinking, right? Google did this thing, therefore let's just do that thing. Let's not really think about it. Um, and I want to note that this, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, there can be helpful ideas in there, right? Uh, but they need to be evaluated in situ, right? In your particular context. Um, I, I think this is an important one. I'm going to skim over it. Uh, next one. Uh, knowledge specialization should always be avoided, right? So this is going to manifest as things like everyone on the team needs to be able to handle every problem. Uh, our best people at X always need to be training others to also do X, something like this. And the reality I'm going to propose is that uh, a little bit like tech deck, uh, tech debt, strategic use of specialization can be a major advantage, right? If you have a bus factor of one on some key topic, obviously that's a problem. Um, but there are more subtle cases. What if you have a bus factor of three? Is that okay? It depends, it depends on the context, right? I've seen organizations adamant uh, about eliminating any kind of specialization. No one is allowed to specialize in anything, constantly transferring people around. Uh, we know someone who could do it in five minutes. We're not gonna let them do it, or we're gonna make them first train five other people to do it. Uh, again, pros and cons to this. Um, but a lot of organizations, just be aware, want to see engineers as fungible, right? Replaceable, we can, they're cogs. It's one cog, another cog, move them, doesn't matter, make a difference. Um, there are obvious benefits to that, uh, but there are also downsides. Be aware of it. And uh, again, you can take lessons from economics here. 
uh, specialization can be hugely helpful for total productivity. Uh, but over specialization can be dangerous, especially in times of crisis. So if your bus factor of one person is now sick or has left the company uh, or is on vacation, uh, that can be a problem, right? Uh, so anyway, the point is, I would say as with technical debt, uh, the ideal amount of specialization is actually greater than zero. Uh, the details of how much greater than zero uh, will depend. So I'm coming on to a conclusion here. Um, what is the unifying idea? What's the common theme? And I want to say that it's this. Humans have a tendency to binary thinking, right? It's tempting. It's a human thing. X is good. Y is bad. X is fast. Y is slow. X is true. Y is false, right? We want to, we want to have these beliefs. I assert few things in reality are actually binary, are actually black and white in this way. And I want to assert that accurate statements are rarely unconditional, right? So. We need to be skeptical of absolutes. When someone tells you closure is good and PHP is bad, just it should be something in your brain that says, oh, I feel uncomfortable about that. Like in the same way, when you see a reset in closure, right? Something's tickling your brain. Well, that's not atomic, right? Maybe we're you know, in the same way, develop a, um, an intuition that absolute statements without context are probably not saying what you think they're saying or are probably not accurate, right? So context matters. Is closure the right tool for the job? Is closure better than PHP? Is functional programming better than object-oriented programming? Are microservices better than a monolith? All of these depend on the context, right? Or where or how should we have management involved, managers involved, right? That depends on the context, my assertion. Where should we pay for quality or accept mess, accept uh, scrappiness, right? That depends on the context. Even how we choose to define quality, right? Which again can mean many different things in many different contexts. It could mean performance, it could mean maintainability, it could mean documentation, it could mean testing. Performance could mean a hundred different things. Part of the reason why online benchmarks maybe shouldn't be trusted. Um, and it could mean different time horizons, right? Do we mean quality now, quality today, quality eventually, right? I made the point that sometimes long term quality happens at the sacrifice of short-term quality, or put differently, emphasizing short-term quality sometimes sacrifices long-term uh, quality. These things matter, and the context uh, matters. So context includes what we are actually trying to do, right? What are we actually trying to achieve? The underlying goal, right? It is often uh, deceptively, uh, deceptively tough to say what the actual goal is. I want to give one quick, uh, I'm, I, I really hope I'm okay with time, but I want to give one quick uh, uh, example of this, uh, which I read the other day, which was interesting, which is that an airline was getting complaints that passengers were coming off the plane and then they were walking to a baggage claim and they were waiting at baggage claim and they were getting irritated because it was taking too long at baggage claim. And the airline underwent a huge operational uh, program to try and cut down the baggage, uh, the baggage wait time or the baggage claim time. And millions of dollars spent or whatever, and they managed to cut it down from five minutes to three minutes. And the passengers were still upset because eh, it still felt too long. And what they actually realized is that they had identified the wrong problem. It wasn't that the passengers were upset that the wait time for baggage was too long. The passengers were upset because they were feeling bored. They felt like they were just sitting around waiting. And what they realized was that the airline could actually just divert the passengers a long way around to the baggage claim, maybe send them through, I don't know, the, the what do you call it, the duty-free area, something like this, um, so that by the time the passengers get to the baggage carousel, the bag is ready. The customers were happy. They were satisfied. Marks through the roof because the wrong uh, problem uh, uh, had actually been identified. They thought that it was baggage claim time. And making that incrementally better was becoming prohibitively expensive. But that wasn't the underlying problem. The underlying problem was just the passengers are bored waiting there. Uh, give them something else to do. Um, so, uh, context includes what we're working with, resources, constraints, things like this, right? Um, and context includes our priorities. Uh, this is important, right? What matters most to us and what can we be flexible? And this relates back to the quality question because you can't prioritize everything. If everything in JIRA, if everything in Trello has a priority of five, you just ignore the priority because at that point it's all the same. You actually get power by having variation in the priority. The more variation in priority status, the more power you have to select between tasks, in a sense. Um, 
So if you are making a decision, example, a choice of tool, free of context, the quality of that decision is going to suffer. Uh, the correct choice is often dominated by context, I would suggest. And yet we often forget this when we are making these kinds of statements. We say closure is good. We say PHP is bad. We say Rails is slow. Microservices are good. Kubernetes is good. Management is bad. Business is clueless. Technical debt is bad. We make absolute statements all the time in our industry. And when we do that, we are flattening what is a multidimensional reality, highly dependent on context, and we are flattening it into a binary output devoid of all context. And it becomes tempting ultimately to start believing this thing in absolute terms, in binary terms, right? We've all met programmers who will say, well, PHP is bad. That's not the case. You can write excellent code in PHP. You can develop brilliant products in PHP. PHP has pros, PHP has cons. You can't say PHP is bad. At least I would like to try to convince you that you cannot say that. Um, and believing that, is bad. Once you get to that point where you actually believe these statements, Rails is slow. Okay, slow for what? Slow in what circumstance? The context matters. And when you eliminate the context, I assert you eliminate the, the truth, the reality that's underneath it. So <clears throat> how do you actually decide? How do you do this properly? Um, firstly, you resist jumping to conclusions, right? Every engineer's favorite thing is to jump to solutions. I've heard the problem. Jump to solution. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about here, a lot of what I've been talking about is actually uh, what you might term sense making. So it's not specifically about solving a problem, but from here on, I'm going to focus mostly on like problem solving, since that's one one way of uh, that's one use of making decisions. Right? We're making a decision how to solve this problem. So I'm going to kind of focus on that from here. Um, anyway, resist jumping to conclusions. Resist jumping uh, to uh, solutions. Instead, understand and agree on the context. Right. What context? Firstly, are you trying to solve a problem, right? Then that problem is part of your context. And is it well-defined? Is it actually the underlying problem even, or is it a symptom? So this goes back to the, you know, the baggage claim delay situation, right? What is actually your problem? Um, and is there agreement about the problem? And is there agreement about the impact of the problem? I'm gonna note this thing about defining problems and defining them clearly is often 50% of the work of actually doing a good job in solving something is in clearly defining the problem and actually confirming that that is a problem. Um, it's so ha often happened, for example, that I, I get called into a company to help with something that they have described as a technical problem. And it turns out it's not a technical problem, right? The technical thing they are observing is a symptom of a cultural problem or is a symptom of a business problem or is a symptom of something else so far away, you have to connect three dots to get there. And, but it manifests right, as engineers complaining about the tech. So anyway, this is not an easy thing to do, uh, but it's important to really think about this. Um, so often you will see programmers, engineers, even very experienced people jump to a solution uh, before we've even properly explained, uh, uh, before we've even properly agreed on what the problem is, the underlying problem. Um, next up, enumerate your options. Uh, again, once we've got the problem descri uh, described, sometimes the solution is obvious, uh, but resist the temptation even then to jump to a solution. Instead, enumerate, what are the options? How could we approach this? What can we do, right? And always retain the idea that there might be something else that's not on the board currently. It might be something else. Enumerate them, right? Go through the process. It's a, it's a good habit to be in. Um, and then ultimately evaluate, right? Filter or sort uh, the options in context. Um, so all of this is context preparation. Um, how do you actually evaluate your options? I said evaluate them as the last step. Well, how do you do that? Um, or what I promised at the beginning, that uh, one secret that will solve all of your problems. So we have our context and we have enumerated our options. Where do we go from here? Uh, what I am going to propose is that we evaluate our options uh, in context. Um, that is, we look at our trade-offs. What do we get? What do we pay? Uh, we look at the pros and the cons, in a particular, the trade-offs weighted by the priorities in our context. Um, ultimately, we're going to be looking at something like this, estimated benefit over estimated cost for the various options, right? So we're at a point, we need to make a decision, we want to solve some particular thing, we've got these six options, how do we evaluate the six options? I'm proposing something like this, estimated benefit over estimated cost. Again, some of you might think this seems trivial. It's like, well, of course, that's how you sort out. It's the same thing we're all familiar with, pros and cons lists. Right? But again, it's uh, remarkable in my experience how easy it is to skip over the nuances with these things, especially when we think we already have the answer. 
So uh, I would propose that it's useful thinking in these terms and maybe having a habit of actually being explicit, right? Stating, this is the problem as I understand it. Uh, these are the options as I understand them. These are the benefits and costs in our context of the various uh, uh, options that we have. Um, and remember, zero cost is not the same as unknown cost. Or unknown cost is not the same as zero cost. If you believe, well, let me put it this way. If you don't know what the cost of something is, don't presume that it's zero. And uh, we often, again, when it's written like this, it's easy to say, oh, no one makes that mistake. There's no one who, who would do that. But actually, this happens often. It happens often. Uh, people want to install Kubernetes. People want to install microservices. People want to install whatever. And uh, why? Well, because we've got a list of you know features on the box, and that's going to solve all our problems, and that's nice. Uh, but then if you ask the question, hold on, so like, what's the downside? The room goes quiet because, well, you haven't really thought of it uh, because that information wasn't, wasn't approximate. It wasn't easily accessible. And we had somehow subconsciously just presumed that probably there's not a big downside. Um, and that may be very wrong. Um, so be careful of this. Be careful of the, the cost blindness. Um, finally, uh, I want to note, I'm not going to go into this in much detail now, especially with the time, but uh, once you come to this idea of estimate the benefit of estimated cost, I want to note this is the kind of thing that uh, doing it in practice maybe is sort of in the, in the rich hickey sense, simple, not easy. It's definitely not easy. Maybe not even simple, but it's 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 simpler than it is easy. Uh, it is a huge topic. There are many nuances in how to actually do this one, uh, do this well. Uh, but the point I want to make is just step number one. It probably gets you already like sixty percent of the value. Is just having an awareness of this. Um, I want to point out this little formula: the estimated benefit over uh, over estimated cost uh, has some helpful mnemonics, right? It reminds you of some things which are important to remember when you're thinking about this. Firstly, uh, value and cost are functions with context as input. Right, which implies that you need to identify and get agreement on what context matters. Relatedly, if you believe that the benefit that you are of this option comes from solving some problem, right? So the benefit is related to solving a problem, then it is clear from this formulation that the estimated value is uh, related to the estimated uh, uh, impact of that problem which means you need a clear problem description. And it means you need agreement on the value of that problem, or at least an estimate of the value of that problem, right? So this, this points you in the direction of we need a clear problem description. If we say that this thing is valuable because it solves problem X, but we don't actually have a clear description of problem X or what value problem X is, then how do you make the assertion that solving it is going to be valuable? You can't do that. It doesn't make sense. Um, also, value and cost are estimates in this formulation, right? And estimates implies probabilistic. Right, so we're talking about how much we understand something, uh, our level of confidence in risks and rewards. So, for example, a common one is um, engineering is asked to propose an option for evaluation by business, and business has to estimate the impact on sales for having some feature, and engineering has to also estimate the cost for implementing the feature. Right, so uh, these are estimates because, as any engineer will hopefully tell you, uh, cost estimates are just estimates. Right. And the accuracy of those estimates can vary a lot, depending on a lot of different things. So it's not a known quantity. It's a probability distribution. What is the likelihood that this project delivers in three days versus a week versus a month versus six months? There is some probability distribution happening in the engineers' minds when they tell you, ah, it will be about a week. Make that clear, uh, or at least be aware of it. Um, also, the use of the word estimation implies precision. And precision usually comes at a cost, right? So this process itself has a cost, right? Estimating benefit and estimating cost, doing this thing itself involves a cost because doing estimates involves a cost. This is, again, like engineering, sometimes you'll be asked to go and do a cost estimate for a particular thing, right? What would it take to build a feature? How do you answer that question? Well, you need to check approximately you know, the API documentation and maybe you need to do a prototype. You've got to do a little research. So there's already a, a, a cost involved in doing uh, the estimate itself. Right, and that hopefully is implied a little bit here by this function, uh, by this uh, formula. Um, so we should always be mindful of how much precision we actually need. Right, ultimate precision is I just built it; it's deployed. Therefore, I know it took exactly three weeks because it's done right now. Uh, and very low precision is I don't know. I mean, it doesn't sound difficult. Maybe a week, and there's a continuum in between. Um, deciding how much precision is applicable in different circumstances uh, matters. Uh, what's the right amount of precision? Uh, that depends on a lot of things, depends on how many options we have. Uh, generally, sorting of n options is going to be order of n. 
Uh, and it depends on the impact of the decision. So Jeff Bezos, um, I, I don't know if he's the one that originated this idea, but he certainly speaks about it a lot. He speaks about the idea of two-way doors or one-way doors when you're making a decision. Some decisions are cheap to make and easy to reverse. It's like a two-way door. You leave the door, you change your mind, you come back, it's no big deal. Some decisions are one-way doors, right? You leave and it's an airlock and it's sealed behind you and that's it. You're not going back inside. Those decisions are a lot scarier because they are uh, usually high impact and they are not easy to reverse. This is maybe something like, hey, we're deciding to do layoffs. Once you've done layoffs, it's difficult to kind of, you know, put that cat back in the box. So there's certain decisions that have uh, uh, that are easy to reverse and some that are not. Be aware of this. Usually the appropriate level of research to put into a decision is going to be proportional to things like this, things like the impact um, and things like whether it's easy to reverse or not. Um, I will note, without going into details, because of time, in practice, good sorting, right? An effective sorting procedure is often approximate, partial, and iterative. Hopefully, you've got some sense of what I mean by those. I'm not going to go into them in much detail. Um, but in the same, I'll point out the one, which is that you don't need to do the estimate all in advance. You can do it lazily, and you can do lazily, uh, like kind of evaluating a sequence lazily. You can go into extra precision as you need it. So we can do a high-level sort of the first five items, uh, does one obviously stand out as superior? Okay, cool, commit to that. Or it might be that two or three are very similar uh, from our first level sort, in which case now you want to go in and be a little bit more precise on uh, uh, maybe estimating the impact or the cost of those things. So now we, we are motivated to spend more to get more precision in order to discriminate between these cases, something like that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so like I say, all this gets complicated in practice and beyond the scope of this talk for sure. Uh, but the key, the key idea, and this is something I want to like really hammer, whether you think in these terms or not, your decisions do exist in this trade-off space, right? I.e., whether you realize it or not, each time you make a choice, you are choosing between alternatives in a context. And this is true even if you are not aware of the alternatives, even if you haven't enumerated them, even if you're not aware of their existence, right? Or you're not even aware of the context of this space, right? You are making decisions that exist in this trade-off space. And um, I want to make the point anyway that having some awareness of this itself, just the awareness of it, is, is useful, right? It is useful for your individual decisions and it is useful for your organization's decisions. Um, this is an important thing. So my advice, all of that is quite abstract. I want to try and make it concrete and I, I am coming to a wrap-up now. Uh, hopefully I can put this a little bit more concretely now. So um, Resist jumping to conclusions or solutions. Uh, clarify relevant context, especially problem descriptions. Please, if there's one thing you take from the talk, it's that. Like, do we have a clear problem description and do people agree that that's actually a problem, clear problem description? Sometimes you'll get three people in the room. One will say, that's the problem. The other one will say, no, that's not the problem. That's not even a problem. Get this clear before you start investing work in something. Uh, then think in terms of trade-offs. What are the trade-offs? There's trade-off space and it's contextual. It's like in a particular context. Uh, weigh those trade-offs by your priorities, right? Different trade-offs mean different things. Closure has some downsides. You know, you pay a cost for immutability by default. Uh, maybe you care about that cost. Maybe you don't. Maybe in some scenarios it matters that closure is uh, generally hosted on a, on a garbage collected platform. Maybe you don't care about that at all. Maybe it's a benefit for you. Maybe it's a cost for you. It depends on your context, right? So be aware that your priorities influence these things. Um, yes, uh, and ask, right? So at a kind of a massive level here. Um, Ask yourself, do you and your organization consistently think in terms of trade-offs when making decisions? Are you thinking in terms of trade-offs or are you jumping to a solution? Um, ask yourself this. Ask yourself honestly. Because again, I've seen it often happen that people will say, yeah, of course we consider trade-offs. Um, but then you ask the question, all right, what are the downsides of that choice you selected? And then again, it's crickets in the room because actually they haven't even really thought of the costs. And if you haven't thought of the costs, you're not doing this kind of trade-off analysis that I'm talking about. Um, finally, kind of, Mathematical level, uh, introspect. How accurate are your benefit, uh, benefit and cost estimates in general? Like, how good are you personally at doing this? How good is the organization at doing this? And it's a skill, like anything else. You know, you need to practice. And the way that you get better at this, or one of the ways that you get better at this, I assert, is that you need to pay attention to how good did you do last time you made an estimate, right? So if you made an estimate as to the benefit of cost of something, and you deploy it, and then it turns out afterwards actually the benefit's way off, or the cost is way off. You need to notice that and maybe spend a little time to go back and say, all right, why did we think this was going to be super beneficial? Well, business told us customers are chomping at the bit of this feature. Well, why did they think that? Well, because the business guy just said, well, I think they would. 
you need to interrogate how did we come to the decision that ended up being uh, uh, based on faulty information. Have that as part of your organizational uh, hygiene in a way, right? You need to occasionally introspect these things or to make like a machine learning analogy. Um, you know, we're, I don't know, classifying an image and uh, our classifier is saying it's a cat. At some point, someone has to step in and say, no, actually it's a dog. And now the model needs to be updated so that next time it sees a cat, it actually says it's a cat. You need to have some sort of uh, uh, self-learning uh, self aspect of this. Um, otherwise it's possible for dysfunction in your ability to make these estimates to persist, right? You'll always be bad at it unless you actually are honest about what's working and what's not working. You can only do that when you look at, you know, what are the estimates we've made uh, and were they accurate in the end or not? Um, I want to note, tying into something else earlier, the effect of being better at trade-offs, this thing we're talking about, is often directional and it is non-linear. So these are the same words I was using when we were talking about 10x programmers or 10x managers or 10x business decisions, right? The effects of being better at trade-offs are often directional and non-linear. The effects can be really big. So this is worth getting better at. Even if you get a little bit better, this is worth it. And if you get a little bit better and you make 50 decisions, those decisions will sometimes compound over time. There are really very big benefits uh, to, be, to be mined here. Um, and I would suggest, again, this is true both at the individual and the organizational level. Um, last one, bonus belief. Six, online advice is correct. Listen to the experts. Hacker News user X said that we should believe Y, therefore we should do that. And Peter said that commenting to do's, uh, committing to do's to production is totally fine, right? Um, no, the reality is that much advice is wrong and most is at least conditional, right? Just because someone says something and uh, they're confident about the way that they say it doesn't mean that it's correct. Just because someone says something that is eloquent, right? Doesn't mean that it's correct. Just because there is a popular opinion, right? Or a popular idea, right? Doesn't mean that it's correct. And even if something is correct, it doesn't mean that it's correct because correct, the term is already misleading. It implies some sort of a universal context. And that's not usually the case. Usually some assertion of truth, right? Some evaluation is conditional. Uh, it is correct in a context, maybe. And when you say thing X without context, you're maybe losing uh, that key contextual information. Um, I'll note, you know, people writing blog posts are often wrong, uh, even when they seem confident. People giving talks are often wrong, even when they seem confident. In fact, it might even be especially when they seem confident, because that's when you're more likely to pay attention to it. And Again, confidence is a weird thing. You never know where someone's confidence is coming from, and it might be through lots of experience, um, and it might be because they're delusional, right? <laughs> you, you can't trust confidence. Um, even if we remove uh, conscious and unconscious bias or incentives, and there are a lot of those, again, you know, human factors are always at play here, but even if you remove those, the Venn diagram, if you're gonna make like a, a Venn diagram intersecting people with like talking skills or writing skills and the skills to actually do this stuff effectively, the intersection, is often smaller than you might expect. Um, they're different skills, right? The ability to give a, 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 a convincing talk, let's say, and the ability to do all of this stuff and talking about do it well, they're not the same skill. So sometimes the people that have very strong opinions about these things uh, or appear to have very strong opinions about these things because they're speaking constantly about them, those may or may not be the people you wanna be completely trusting just out of hand, right? My advice is check any advice that you are given against your own intuition, right? Ask stupid questions, ask fundamental questions. Some of my favorite moments in engineering meetings are when someone raises a hand and say, hold on, stupid question, uh, why are we doing this, right? Those are the kinds of questions that often get to the fundamental stuff, right? Use your own intuition, um, consider might this person who's giving the advice have some sort of an incentive, uh, an agenda or a bias that maybe they don't even consciously realize, right? I might be telling you stuff that's completely bonkers and I am saying it all in good faith. I don't even realize that I'm biased, that maybe something about my situation or whatever is, is it contains a, a kind of bias. Again, it's a human thing. Be aware of it. Um, perhaps their advice is somehow phrased quite generally. This happens all of the time. Use Kubernetes, you should be doing this. Use microservices, microservices are great. And they provide no context or conditionals. Um, and I wanna note, again, reality is messy. True things are usually true within a specific context. Uh, true statements are rarely conditional. Real truth tends to be messy and conditional. So look for those conditionals. If they're not there, uh, my suggestion is to have a bit of disease, right? Don't feel comfortable with that. Um, this is relevant, for example, when it comes to best practices. I want to diverge on this a little bit. Um, we often conclude something that was good for Google is good for you, right? Google did it, Stripe did it, therefore we should do it. 
Um, and I want to note this in particular is, is kind of an egregious case because you are copying often someone else's decisions without understanding their context or their inputs, right? By all means, take inspiration from what uh, Google did, right? Um, but And by all means, uh, copy their decision-making process, but do not copy their decision. That by analogy is like caching a function result when you don't know the inputs. You're seeing the result, you know there's some function there, and you're just assuming, I don't know, most of the time you don't even know the inputs. You don't know how they came to that decision. That context might or might not apply to you, right? Question what you hear, question the arguments, question the evidence, right? And uh, question in proportion to the cost of being wrong. So this goes back to the one-way door, two-way door things, right? If Peter is suggesting that you, maybe it's okay to put to-dos in your production, uh, maybe that's not the end of the world. Uh, if Peter is suggesting, you know, you should occasionally set your servers on fire uh, just to see whether, I don't know, the, the, the sprinkler systems come on, maybe you wanna be a little bit more cautious about accepting that advice. Um, and as with quality, most things don't matter, right? Ignore the things that don't matter so that you have the time and energy to really interrogate the things you do, right? Information you get is gonna be sometimes very useful, sometimes not so useful, sometimes applicable. Like the things that are fundamental, try to get into them, try to see if it makes sense, does it make sense in your situation and so on. Um, and uh, apply balanced skepticism, that's it, right? Um, ultimately, nothing beats thinking hard in situ, like in your own context, thinking hard about your own context, thinking about whether some particular advice, some particular tool, some particular methodology makes sense in your case. Uh, nothing beats the hard thinking. Um, and that is it. I'm sorry for running so late. Gosh, I don't even know how much time.